Hello, this Hangout on Air is live. Welcome to this history, government, politics, open topic number one. Um, so I sent a link to the International Beer Review Guild. And uh, anybody that wants to discuss history, government, and politics, start talking about it, asking questions, joining the Hangout, whatever. Here we are, three o'clock. Whoa, hello. <laughs> up there, Ronnie? Alex, I got a lot of noise coming at me. Sorry about that, bud. I didn't mean to call you. I just called you because I, I, you uh, texted me earlier, and, and I just trying to see what was going on because I saw the... Uh... I, I'm on live, on the air live right now, actually. And it's called History, Government, Politics, Open. And oh. so it's an open forum, and uh, we'll see what people ask about. If they ask anything, we'll see what happens. If not, we'll just cancel it. But uh, people tend to ask me questions about history, government, politics. You have asked me questions in the past about, uh, I'm drinking Schlitz beer, by the way, third beer of the day. Third this out of be four. One day to get that, because I've been looking for that for so long. Yeah, three out of four. This is the third out of four. Um, so you had asked me years ago, or about, yeah, Good while back about Leander Perez, and then you asked me something else about Huey Long yeah. and Earl Long. You know those, yeah. all those you know that. Oh yeah, that's uh, right. That's right. Uh, I know that drives so, you nuts, but I can't help it. <laughs> Go ahead, Ron. Drive, doesn't drive me nuts. Um, put it on live chat. All right, so let's see what people are saying. Uh, so we asked about Earl Huey and Earl Long. They were famous characters in Louisiana. I'm not going to go into that again. I would say notorious characters, especially Huey Long, who had a dictatorial type personality, similar. He had a tendency to kind of like try to be a Mussolini type guy. And uh, he was shot in mysterious circumstances, shot and killed in 1935 in mysterious circumstances. And uh, yeah, I'm going to get to that average technician. He's asking about the new Green Deal. So, um, And my grandmother actually went to the funeral and she said it was very uh, hot. <laughs> it was in August. I think it was hot. Earl Long, Earl Long, um, not as dictatorial. More, yeah, he wasn't. Yeah, he was more eccentric and um, probably had some fairly serious mental health problems. <laughs> mental health problems, but he was very intelligent. Um, but he was a one of these progressives, and so he promoted a lot of uh, liberal liberal stuff, um, like uh, uh, other Southern uh, progressives, like uh, Lyndon, what's all that noise? Lyndon Johnson, and that stuff. So uh, you want to keep the noise at at the absolute minimum. And so Leander Perez was from the South. He was a Latino American. Um, his heritage, at least, probably not his language, but he um, would be more of the old right, paleo conservative old right um, character, arch segregationist, uh, and a dictator in a local sense, dictatorial, had dictatorial control over St. Bernard Parish and Plaquemines Parish, and um, could bring a lot of votes to the table. So he had a lot, he had a lot of people's ear in Louisiana up until he died in 1969. Now, going on. So Average Technician says the new Green Deal. I've been hearing about that on um, television. Um, in 2016, 17, and 18, I listened to and watched, but CNN, I mostly listen because I'm doing stuff. I'll listen to it. CNN. And so I heard that for three years. I said, okay. I, I'm getting tired of hearing this. So I said, now let me listen to Fox News. Um, and I'll listen to that for 2019 and see what they're saying. It's a lot different. I don't really care for their style or their hijinks. But, um, uh, you know, I'm listening to it. And they've been talking about the Green New Deal. And they're saying, oh, this, this one wants this. This one wants that. So, well average technician, what do I think about it? I think it's a very terrible idea. Uh, 
these people, um, you hear about conspiracy theories all the time. These people are, are building their whole their whole worldview on conspiracy theories. So um, it seems like a bizarre idea. Uh, all these radical radical really if you want to say attacks on the economy and would devastate the united states we're not trying to turn the united states into cuba or china in 1976 when mao died uh that's what this would do so my attitude toward it would be i would be totally opposed to it at out of hand i would not support any part of it he says sound like communism to me well that's because things sound like what they are, you know, so um, generally. So yeah, there's your answer. I would be 100% opposed to it, would never support it. Hey, Ronnie, one more yeah. question, what I need to ask is that when Huey was in charge, why did he not go after Judge Leander Perez? Because Huey Long and Earl Long were not a racist, as far as I know. So I'm confused because why he didn't go after Judge Leander Perez if he was in that why judge because judge leander perez is racist so i don't understand why he didn't go after judge leander perez i just you know i don't want to get into it too much but i just want i've been thinking about that now why let me ask you why are you in the dark let me ask you this question you look like you're in the, you're in hiding are you in hiding? well i just don't like to show my face all this public but that's all why. right huh? don't show it if you don't want to okay okay I only got. I only have a problem with people hiding their identity when they want to go and bother people. You know, like they want to go around attacking everybody. You're this and you're that, and this one's bad and this one's bad. And I'm I, like, well, who are you? I, 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 tell them, no. <laughs> I, I tell them, well, who are you? Oh, you don't need to know that. Well, yeah, I do need to know that. You're you're talking like big shot, but uh, it, it, you're being very nice and uh, you've always been very kind and polite. So you know, fine. You, we know your name is Alex, so you don't have you don't have to show your identity. Ruku, who does beer reviews, doesn't show his face. He's always very nice and pleasant and polite and easygoing, and uh, so you know we don't need to know who he is. Uh, he's not calling people out on this or that. Why didn't they go after? Uh, well, they were actually allies. They were allies of Leander Perez. In fact, well, they were friends. Okay, right? Is that what it means? Well, I don't know if they were personal friends, but they were political allies. Oh, okay, that's why. All right. They, uh, uh, Leander Perez, Judge Perez helped get Huey Long elected. He, uh, helped support the Long faction all the way through. Um, they only had a bad falling out around 1956. Oh, really later than that, 50s, 58, 59, when the real desegregation crisis occurred. And, Perez was telling Earl Long, you know, you got to fight this. You got to fight uh, integration. You're just a pet. You know, you're too soft. You, you're one of those progressives. You want to go along with it. Uh, what are you going to do to fight it? We got to battle it out. And um, Earl said, oh, well, I mean, I'm not quoting him directly, but he was saying stuff along the lines of, oh, you're just too wound up about that. You need to forget about it. Uh, these things are going to change. Uh, don't worry about it. As far as a lot of issues, Perez was what we would call a progressive or a liberal. Uh, he supported like new New Deal ideas. You know the ideas of the New Deal, uh, Southern progressive ideas like uh, free hot lunches for students or hot lunches, free textbooks, free textbooks old age pension checks for old, you know the elderly so really he was like a lot of these guys they were very progressive until it came to the racial integration then they threw a fit because they were very uh old-fashioned in that sense so that's where he started attacking earl long as being an enemy of the old south earl long was not really interested in integration he didn't really support it hmm. he would have supported and would have preferred to have segregation okay let's be honest Earl Long and Huey Long would have been fine you know have black schools white schools and, and so on so they, they didn't really have a problem with that 
Uh, but um, uh, that's just a fact. Now, but when it came time for with the uh, Brown versus Board of Education, the Civil Rights Act, and all that, then they didn't really oppose it. So they didn't. They didn't actively support it, but they didn't fight it. Whereas Landa Perez was saying, and like uh, Willie Rankin in North Louisiana, Leander Perez called for what he described as a quote, scorched earth, unquote, policy to fight integration. <laughs> that sounds craziness. <laughs> so he was like very um, hardcore about that. And then he had a lot of conspiratorial ideas about who was behind it and everything. So progressive on all the other issues, but fanatical when it came to racial integration. Um, and in fact, he wouldn't go along with it. Like in, in Plaquemines Parish, they were willing they were willing to do practically anything to um, stop it. And so they networked with other groups like that around the country. So that's where that stands. So let's see. Uh, average technician says, well, identity politics and radical leftism caused the Democratic Party to dissolve and reform. I think it will cause a terrible problem for the Democratic Party. There's already internal an internal war going on, I guess you could call it, in the party between the establishment guys and gals, <laughs> the establishment faction and the new left faction, which is not new, right? It's old. This is ideas going back a long time. But uh, as we were talking about in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, well, I wasn't talking about it in the 60s. I was saying, ga, ga, goo, goo. But, um, <laughs> Ron. you know, but I mean, my people, my philosophical, political ideolo ideologues, all right, fellow travelers. So they were saying in all those decades, Watch out, watch out. The communists are here. They're in America. They're teaching in the high schools. They're teaching in the colleges. They've taken control. That's where the danger is. And so, you know, they say, you're out there fighting them in the jungles of Vietnam. You should be worrying about the ones in the, in the um, classroom in Berkeley, New Orleans, New York, Chicago, whatever. So you got a lot of young people who don't read, they don't study, they don't know anything. So they they get uh, what you would say they get, you don't want to use the term brainwash because that would be related to conditioning, but it's a sort of like conditioning or the best term is just edu um, educated, um, molded, what's the word, uh, inculcated, uh, I would say infected. Uh, with this kind of uh, Marxist-Leninist, Maoist uh, ideology. So um, being young, I knew about these things. So I was able to inoculate myself against the virus. So when I would hear that stuff being taught in college, I would just say to myself, <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. But I was smart enough. I was trying to get a degree. So I was smart not to go after the professors because they'll they're very uh, vindictive. So they'll they'll put you in a bad they'll they'll mark you out. Oh, you're one of them. And then your grades will suffer and they'll uh, target you. And I didn't want to be targeted. So I was able to kind of manipulate the situation where I could listen to what they were saying, obviously reject it but play along with it to where maybe they wouldn't get wise to what I was saying or get too much of an angle. And then professors are very pompous and uh, they love to hear their own music. So when I would take a test, I would never say I agree with any of this. I would just say, well, this writer said this and this author said this and this was discussed. And they would say, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. And I'm thinking to myself, huh, all I'm doing is repeating what you said. 
I never did endorse it. I just said the people said it. <laughs> so that was there's ways to get around it. A lot of people that don't know they'll get really in trouble. You know, they'll get they'll get uh they'll get destroyed by the machine if they don't know how to handle it. Now, so yes, average technician, I think that it could just dis really disrupt the party. It's been going on. It look look at 1968, the big uproar in the party. So um of course, the establishment Democrats aren't exactly uh, right wing. You know, they're uh, pretty, you could almost say, died in the world socialists with most of their programs. So it's really not that big of a difference. It's just that it's really a, a matter of being in a hurry and not being in a hurry. Because one time I heard someone say, what's the difference between a socialist and a communist? And they said, a communist is a socialist in a hurry. I said, OK. Now, see, a communist is a socialist in a hurry. Okay. <laughs> now, Canada Dry Hand says, I don't see it. I don't see the problem with a green deal. You don't, huh? Well, let's call it a red deal. And I don't mean red like on the map when they show the Republican Party. I mean red like, you know, red star over Russia type ideology. Uh, Democratic Kampuchea, the red <laughs> The red cap that you see, the radicals, uh, the lodge members wear, and the, uh, on the uh, the uh, the government crests of Peru and the United States and all that. Uh, hello, Ryan. What beer are you drinking now? Max Walt says hello, Max Walt in 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 uh, Russia, the Russian Federation. I'm drinking Schlitz. Got a good price on it. Now, what do you think about these things, uh, Alex? I think they're interesting, very interesting. I'm just sitting here listening and trying to shake it all in. It's very hard to get it all in here. here. Yeah, so he's listening and taking it in. <laughs> all right. That's a good idea. Um, like Henry Hill, and uh, he just said, I'm, list I'm just listening. Now, um, you don't talk much. You don't eat much. Hey. Um, well, I eat a lot, Ron. I eat nah, a lot. I'm just referencing something else. Yeah. You know? Oh, okay, bud. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's see if we have any other uh, comments. Um, any other uh, suggestions what to talk about? That's why we have the open topic. Open topic means it's open. You talk about it. We'll discuss it. And you can join us if you want and hang out. Um, I have another topic, Ron. Feel free to talk. It's open. When I say open, it's open. Yeah, I know. Um, what about JFK? What about him? What do you think? Do you, who do you think really killed JFK? Do you think it was Oswald? Or do you think it was somebody else? I don't know. You don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, it's the kind of thing you can think about all day long. And you never can figure it out. You know, it's... Uh, no, you never will. <laughs> it's a peculiar. Well, you might if you could get the if you could get good information. It's a strange thing. I'm not a Kennedy supporter. I mean, if I'd have been a voter back in the '60s, I wouldn't have supported him. You know, but I mean, uh, I don't think people should be murdered. On the other hand, either. Uh, <clears throat> Max Walt says, "Oh yeah, and hello to you, Alex." Uh, What's up, man? I just like to investigate things. That's all. It's you know historical history. So. Yeah, Kennedy. Well. It's a mystery. Oswald is mysterious. He's from New Orleans, was from New Orleans. I believe he was born in Oklahoma, but he grew up in New Orleans, lived in New York, New York City for a while. His family came from a real messed up family and um, his childhood was terrible. And he, uh, he was like a, a lot of these guys that get involved in these things. They're like a loner male, but he, he, he is very strange. His life was strange, and it makes you wonder who he was really working with because. Yes, I agree. He goes to the Marines, gets, okay, Tex Mex says I'm drinking an ice cold Estrella, Estrella, Estrella Yalisco beer, and it's mighty fine. Oh, yeah, I like those. We, we enjoyed it on the road trip. MK Ultra Victim says average technician. This I don't know. Usually that would 
that would target somebody like a, a Miley Cyrus or, a, um, you know what I mean? Like, a, or like a rock band, like the Grateful Dead to try to, for certain programming reasons, you know, not necessarily going to target the president of the United States, but you know, average technician could be an affiliated thing, but Oswald joins the Marines. He does okay, gets a marksman badge, which supposedly isn't that hard to get. This means you could shoot the rifle and hit targets. Oh. Right? Okay, marksman, Marine marksman. Got dismissed from the Marines by going around trying to hand out communist pamphlets all day. Oh. And they say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just handing out communist propaganda. That's my right as an American, you know. So he got booted out. But then he had this then he decides, I'm going to move to the Soviet Union. Okay. H Hale Brock says, uh, hello, Hale Brock. Thanks for watching. A man named Jerry Croth, Croth put out put a couple of really good JFK videos. He has an interesting YouTube channel. I might watch that. Um, goes to the Soviet Union, marries this woman. Uh, what's her name? Marina? Mar Mar um. I don't remember. I'm trying. I can see her face, but I can't yeah, remember. Uh, got connections to the Soviet government. So there's two ways of looking at it. He was going around talking this communism stuff over there, and they thought he's some kind of crackpot and weren't interested in what he was shopping. Well, you never know. He could have been on drugs. Right? Could have been. But yeah, what I mean is, I'm not talking about the drugs. I mean that the Soviets might have thinking he's some kind of American, uh, you know, intelligence agent. Intel, you know, like over there acting like he's communist so that he can gather information and marry this Soviet woman. So oh, he was they undercover kind of like. He was undercover kind of like, basically. Yeah, because people do that all the time. Right. And so uh, they work for the other side and they just, they're play acting. Like a lot of these people, they'll dress up with a swastika and all of this and go around saying crazy things and call a radio show and talk crazy. And you say to yourself, well, that guy's play acting. You know, this is not, he's, this, this that's an old strategy of trying to pretend you're, you're, you're the opposition and you trying to discredit the op opposition, but during the cold war. So you, you pretend you're a communist, you get kicked out of the Marines or you make it look like you got kicked out the Marines. Right. And then, so you go to the Soviet union talking all the communist talk and then uh, they are wise to you. So they say, eh, yeah, okay. <sighs> Why don't you scram, get out of here. So, he didn't stay long and then he left Then he came back to America, got a bunch of odd jobs, still going around talking all that communist talk, handing out the pamphlets, being very conspicuous, you know, making sure that he's on TV, he's getting a name for himself, which could make you start to believe that it was an act. I don't know. Yeah, if it was true. yeah you know, was it an act or was it not? <laughs> was he just some kind of nut, you know, a crackpot? <laughs> or was he clever and working for the right <clears throat> agency? And um, the jobs he got were very strange. He very could be KBG or whatever. Yeah, the Russian mo uh, the Russian uh, FBI, whatever it is, right? That's what KBG means, right? Pretty much, yeah, like kind of like internal security uh, agency. Um, yeah. So he, you know, he gets – a job at a coffee company, Riley Foods in New Orleans. You say, well, so, yeah, but the coffee company shared the parking lot with the FBI <laughs> headquarters in New Orleans. And apparently he would go and leave envelopes on his car windshield, you know, under the windshield wiper, and people would pick them up, and then later they would leave envelopes and he would come pick them up. I don't know. Sounds strange. Um, I agree. <laughs> what else did he do? He... Uh, he uh, had a job that was next door to the headquarters of the Communist Party USA in New Orleans. Uh, 
I have the address. I have the address now, Perdido Street. I don't know what's in the building now. I even have the name of the guy that was there. So uh, sure. then, he, then he goes and works. And now Riley, about a, I got to watch what I'm saying. So Riley, the Riley family had very close connections, had very close connections to the CIA. He goes and works for this company in Dallas. And he inexplicably goes to Dallas to work for a company. He says, well, what's this company? Oh, they, 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 they do aerial maps, aerial photography. You say, well, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but they did aerial photography for CIA. Okay, now. Hey, Ron, is this guy's name Guy Bannister? You heard of him, right? Sure, of course. Who? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention when he was in the Marines, he was in Japan working at an air base. And that's where the U-2 spy plane took off. And they, and they flying over Soviet Union, and uh, about six months after you started working there, it got shot down. You know what? Francis Gary Powers on there, so just happened to be at the right place at the right time, I guess. Um, Tex Mex said, Didn't uh, Oswald travel to the Soviet embassy in Mexico City? Yeah, he was either him or somebody trying to look like him. Uh, there's a conspiracy about that. Yeah, I've heard about that, about two two Oswalds or something. I don't know how that can be, but. Well, just people cop copying his mannerisms and his uh, his looks and going around being conspicuous, making sure people notice them and uh, trying to place him in different locations for various reasons. Uh, so those are strange occurrences, like going to the shooting range in Texas and shooting other people's targets. Hmm. And they're saying, what are you doing? Get out of here. Who are you? I'm Oswald. I'm. You know, uh, and they say, uh, oh, yeah, well, OK. But, you know, they don't think much of it until they see it on TV. The president, they arrested uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. And they say, oh, that's that guy. Yeah, shooting at the. All right. So. Um, hey, Ron, I want to ask you, do you know who Guy Bannister is or no? Yes, I do. OK. And I know who Dean Andrews is and I know who uh, David Ferry is. And I know who Leighton Martins is and I know who. All those people are. <laughs> yeah. All all strange people. The way I see it anyway. <laughs> and I know who Alton Oshner is. Oh, I never heard of him. <laughs> yeah. Think. No. But 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 there's something to do with that. And um uh uh so he's hanging out and living with these people in Dallas, but yet they've got strange connections to Northern Virginia and certain facilities there too. And everybody he hangs out with, they all got connections to certain facilities in Northern Virginia, don't you know? Now, uh, so, um, and then he's there in Dallas on uh, November 22nd, 1963, 1230 PM, working at the Texas School Book Depository. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> More strangeness, more strangeness. So yeah. you're asking the question, could he have done it? Yeah, he could have done it. Did he do it? I don't know. Did he have help? Maybe, hey, probably. You never know. Probably. Uh, but I never could figure out who he was working for. I don't know if he's a left wing pretending to be a right wing, pretending to be a left wing, or if he's the right wing pretending to be a left wing, pretending to be a right wing. Because, um, and it involves a lot of Cuban refugees, being trained in Lacombe, Louisiana, and involves a raid on that compound, involves the Kennedy administration, involves the attorney general, it involves uh, Carlos Marcello, uh, mafia head of the uh, New Orleans organized crime. Um, what was he, the Costello family? It involves, um, yeah, uh, um, David Ferry. The whole thing is just totally crazy, you know. Um, the day of the assassination. Killed himself. Hey. Eh? I said some people say David Ferry killed himself, but I don't believe so because David Ferry was afraid to die. That's what the movie says. I don't know if that's true. Well, he he decided to write two typewritten suicide notes 
and um, yeah, his death was very strange. Yes. And he used to do a lot of flights into Cuba before, during, and after the revolution. Uh, he had very close connections to some questionable activity in New Orleans and uh, <laughs> various people like Guy Bannister and Clay Shaw and uh, uh, Dean Andrews and all of them. Oswald also. So, uh, and uh, medical experimentation, experiments. Okay, uh, Ari LaFleur says, great topic, sipping an ice cold bottle of Schlitz, having visited Dealey Plaza on two occasions. I can never understand why Oswald never attempted a shot as the motorcade was driving toward him. Well, wouldn't it be easier to have the motorcade pass you and then you got a clear shot to the back of somebody's head uh, and then you got the other guys up on that little knoll and they got the other shot from the front? Because I went up there behind that fence on the knoll. That was a perfect place to be. And uh, well, it seemed like a good location to do that because uh, that sixth floor, if you go up there, I went up there and they have an X on the street where they painted where he was shot. That's a perfect place to sit. People are saying, uh, oh, nobody could hit anybody from that high up. I got up there and said, I could hit somebody very easily from this. This this is not that high with a, a rifle, a high powered rifle with a scope. I don't see, and you have training and practice. It wouldn't be particularly difficult. Um, the, the car wasn't moving fast. And, uh, and then if you have help from another angle, so it shouldn't be too difficult. Now, why the car was slowing down, why they had all these people on the street making these peculiar, strange signals like opening umbrellas, catching a seizure. That's crazy. Uh, aqua, aqua Marine, uh, what is that? A Plymouth, um, Plymouth Valiant driving around, around, and around. So I don't know. The whole thing, that's a little strange. But um, David Ferry drives to Houston, Texas the night of the assassination. <laughs> So they could go roller skating. Then makes a phone call. Yeah, it makes a phone call to Chicago. Then the, the the same phone in Chicago makes a phone call to Dallas Saturday morning to a Jack Rubenstein's uh, phone number. Hmm, makes you wonder. Okay. Uh, said they were duck hunting, had no guns with them. Um, that is weird. Well, you see, it was at first they thought, eh, some nut, you know, a loner, a loner, crackpot. But then once Oswald got shot, then everybody really started to think, okay, this was some kind of big, big uh, conspiracy, a big plot. Had to be because uh, just it's just too obvious that somebody's trying to be silenced. And, uh, So I just don't know. And another thing is, I don't know. I mean, you get these kind of suspicious characters in New Orleans, like Oswald. You just don't know what they're out. You know, you don't know what their angle is. It's kind of like David Duke. I've tried to talk to people about him. I said, I don't know what his angle is. I, I've said for a long time that David Duke could be an asset, could have been an asset all along for the government because there's too many strange things with him. Okay. Have you guys seen the video of James Files confessing to being the grassy nose shooter? He tells a pretty convincing story. No, I haven't seen that. Seems strange that somebody would confess that. What were you asking me, Alex? I don't remember. I don't oh. So I've had suspicions about David Duke. He's got a background that's similar to Oswald. It's very strange. A lot of people that are younger don't know who I'm talking about. They're saying, who the heck is David Duke? A I know who David Duke is. He was a Ku Klux Klan wizard back in the day. I know who that is. <laughs> right? Well, that's what he said. <laughs> he's uh I hate he's to tell you, Ron, a lot of these people that we talk about, 
not many people know who they are. Judge Leander Perez. I mean, like you said, you have to be like maybe 40 or 50 to know about these people. And I'm 33. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. David Duke, he, um, I don't know why he traveled to Laos in 1971 because that's where the height of the Vietnam War was in 1971. It was it was the main battles. The main battles were in Laos. What was that operation? Operation I can never remember that. It's a. Uh, I could find it. I could find it very easily, but uh, which actually turned out to be a fiasco for the United States. Army, well, not the U.S., but it, the the South Viet, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnamese Army. I think that's when Nixon said, "We got to get out of here quick. These people are clowns." But uh, you know, David Duke said, "Oh yeah, I was in Laos for a year because I was going to teach English." That's a bizarre thing to do while you're a college student during the Vietnam War to go to Laos of all places to teach English, and he never did. And he was traveling on a diplomatic passport, which was strange too. Not a blue passport, but a red one. I don't get it. Okay. Uh, well, there's more to him, but okay. And there's <laughs> there's things involving Caribbean stuff in 1980. Okay. Steve from Philly says, where's the beer and the whiskey? Oh, well, we're doing beer. We're doing history, government, politics. Dibble and dabble in other interests. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm always interested in politics, history, and government. Tex-Mex says Oswald was either a Soviet intelligence asset or a deep state or a mafia or some other entities pawn. Right. You know what I mean? Like, was he a communist or was that just a show? Hmm. You have to think about these things. Like, I... I can't figure it out. Was Oswald a communist pretending to be a right winger, pretending to be a communist? Now that's very plausible because there's certain things that don't make sense. Okay. Let's just say you're a right winger and you're pretending to be a communist. Okay. Smart thing to do. You get a lot of good information. They got people that do that now. They infiltrate these organizations. Okay. All right. Intelligence gathering, whatever, disruption, agitation, propagation, propaganda, etc. But here's the thing that doesn't make sense. Now he got arrested at the Texas theater after the Kennedy was killed. You're arrested. That's it. The jig's up. And then he, he hit a cop. He hit he a did. cop, too. I think he did. He shot a cop, yeah. So he got arrested for killing the president, shooting a cop. And it's pretty clear you're not getting out of prison. And you're probably not going to come out of Dallas alive. And he didn't. But you've been arrested and the jig's up. But what does he do when he gets arrested? He makes this. On TV, he makes the communist salute. So anytime you see that clenched fist, like a lot of these people in the House of Representatives like to do, <laughs> he makes this salute to the cameras to let people know the hammer and sickle did this. Now, if you are playing a game, why are you going to do that now? That's telling me you're a true believer. You're you're giving a signal that this is what it's really what this is what it was about all along because because it's over now. You're dead. You know? Getting some echo. He's dead. So he was killed the next day. So that is what doesn't make sense. It's kind of like this story with uh Patty Hearst. I have wondered this for so long. Was Patty Hearst kidnapped or was it staged? My belief that is that it was probably staged. In other words, she was a, she believed in the Sibionese, Symbionese Liberation Army. She believed in those communist ideals and she took up with them and they made it look like she was kidnapped from her dormitory and that she ran wild with them. But once she got arrested and caught, then her very powerful Hearst publishing family got her out and said, oh yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, she was brainwashed and uh, she didn't know what she was doing and she got kidnapped and she had the Stockholm syndrome and all of that. 
could be true, but I don't know. There's there's certain signs that it wasn't true because she got arrested. What's the first thing she did? She pulled the Oswald. She makes the salute. First thing she does, hmm. and she she puts on her uh, occupation guerrilla. What she guerrilla warrior or something like that? <laughs> uh, gr urban war urban warfare activist. I don't know, man. I think she might have been parted out all along because you get a lot of these rich kids, these uh, rich, whatever they call it, millionaire brats, and they're involved in radical politics. Their parents probably are too. Okay. Um, even though they're so-called capitalists, I believe that Oswald was simply a lone nut, says Ari LaFour. Americans back in 1963 did not want to accept their president was killed by a nut. Also, Oswald was probably on some FBI or CIA, CIA watch list, and he was not. Okay, let's say he's a lone nut. Well, he had an incredible ability to be at the right place at the right time. Hmm. A lone nut who just happens to work for this guy who's affiliated with the CIA, happens to work at this job, which is affiliated with the CIA, happens to work at this place, which is involved with aerial photography, happens to work at this base where the U-2 spy plane is launched. I mean, uh, I don't know. He might, like he's saying, he was on a watch list and he wasn't locked up, so then they covered it up because they were embarrassed. Could be. They got embarrassed because they, like a lot of these guys now, that's, now R.A. LaFleur is right about that. A lot of these guys are on the payroll and they know they're crazy, but they use them to get information. And these guys are all careerists, you know, so they can have a big arrest and say, look, we, we arrested all these potential terrorists, whatever. So, but then the guys are really crazy. So they do something crazy. So now that the intelligence agency got egg on its face and says, no, oh, oh, what are we going to do? But I don't know about Oswald. I mean, is it possible he was just a lone nut? It's, tr it's possible. He sure did have an ability to affiliate with everybody. <laughs> kind of like uh, Mark David Chapman, who just happened to travel to the most exotic places in the 1970s and early 80s. You know, I hate to say this, Ron, we're never going to really know what really, really happened. No, maybe, not. Sucks, but, uh, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe um, not. I think a lot of people are reluctant to believe in these complicated scenarios because it makes them uncomfortable because we want to believe that the people in charge are honest and are trying to do the best for us. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling and an insecure feeling when you realize that they don't have your best interest at heart and that they're not trying to do the right thing and that they're involved in a lot of bad things. And so we, we want to say, oh yeah, it was just some that guy that had unusual access to the president. So it's it, it gets people out of their comfort zone and it's scary. It's scary. It is scary to think that the people you think are the good guys, you find out they're not the good guys and they're not doing good things. And they're not good, they're bad, they're evil. And so, um, and they're up to bad things. And so it's very uncomfortable. People wanna say, no, it's America, it's apple pie, Chevrolet and mom, and we're the good guys and they're the bad guys over there across the water in Russia. And it's as simple as that. And I watch Fox News and I got bumper stickers and I support my military and you. And so that's the easy way. I agree. You can have a comfort zone. Would it be better for me not to know those things and to just say it's cut and dry and I'm proud of this and I'm proud of that and hoorah, it would be more comfortable. It's not comfortable to know these things. 
But once the cat's out the bag and you find out, then you can't go back. Like the Fleetwood Mac song, can't go back again. <laughs> you can't put the cat back in the bag. You can't put Pandora's box closed again. It's out. It's out and you can't go back under the rock. Okay. Squeaky Fromm took a shot at President Ford. Again, a lone nut. Yeah, we better not talk about Squeaky From, Annette, Lynette Squeaky From, because that's another two-hour show. <laughs> Woo! Um, uh, here trip, all, everyone. Hold on, what's all that? Um, yeah, I'll never say never to always. I'll never say always tonight. All right, she's out of jail. John Martin says, live in the real world. She's out of jail. I am in the real world. Okay, uh, well, anyway, so interesting discussion. Uh, if anybody's got any last comments. Okay, Hale says, uh, <laughs> most of the things the government does now is a litmus test to see how much the people will tolerate. I agree with that. It's getting scary what people will tolerate these days, such as the new, the Green New Deal. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's an, oh, not you, everybody. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's all about gradualism. You have to remember, 85 years ago, people would have said, I can't believe I live to see the day when the U.S. government would perpetuate this new deal on us. I'm talking about the new deal. A lot of people thought, this is not America. This is a different country. This is like, what are we, under Mussolini or something over here? You know. So, um, But you get that, then you go a little further, you get the... Truman stuff, then you add the Johnson, the Kennedy, and then the Johnson, then the Nixon. Just keep adding to the pyramid, right? Build the pyramid. And so we say the Green New Deal, there's no way it can't happen, but you just gradually see that's that's the whole story of the tortoise and the hare, which it's like what they would teach at a lodge one of those lessons you know you can learn lessons you can learn allegories and they're going to teach you those things don't be a hare don't be in a rush you'll you you won't get to the, the you won't get to the waterfall you got to be like the tortoise slow and steady wins the race you may not live to see the new world. You may not live to see the tower. You may not live to see them build the stairway to heaven, but you're helping build the path to the waterfall. So John Martin says, new green new deal insanity. So that's the whole idea behind what we're seeing. So they slowly build brick by brick. Um, now, of course it isn't gonna succeed. We know that from Christian eschatology study of prophecy but they don't i'm talking about what they're being taught in a, like a lodge so they say i'm learning about geometry i'm learning about the pyramid i'm learning about all this create this new world this paradise on earth so they're they're, they're corrupted by their own by their, their own brightness as the bible says so like you say, progressives are very patient. Very patient, you mean. Yeah, very patient. Build slowly. You want to steer the ship. Steer the ship, but you just tack left slowly. You just slowly nudge the boat left. And uh, I observed this being, I used to be Baptist before I converted to Rome, to the Catholic Church in 2001. And you you could you could observe these things that you would always have the smiling, friendly Mason, pretty Mason brother. You could watch it. You could tell who they were. You could tell these were the people running the show, not the not the minister. Although his fam his father might have been a master Mason himself, but so they're very smart because they hang back. They don't say a lot. They don't talk a lot. They're very clean, clean, well-dressed. 
their manners are impeccable. And they're always steering that ship just slowly steering the ship left, left, the sinister side, sinister side, left, left, left. But no rush, no rush, slowly left, slowly left, the voice of moderation. And so those people are the ones that will win the day, not, not your, you know, the ones throwing the grenade, running around with the red flag and screaming, uh, God is dead. They're, they're kind of embarrassing, you know, they're, they're useful though. So that's how you got to look at those things. You got to observe and, and you got to, you got to be able to read the signposts, read the signposts. Uh, and if you can read the signposts, then you can uh, start to read the map. And when you can read the map, you can, you can find out the travel plans, <laughs> so to speak. John Martin says, true, Mr. Terrio. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, we're on the journey. We're pilgrims on earth. This is not the final destination. Some people think it is because they live, they're of this world. Okay. Uh, Steve from Philly says, sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Right. Everywhere a sign post. Well, that's another topic, how you can read, you know, reading the, reading, reading the signs and hearing the shibboleths. Okay, well, uh, thanks for watching this open history, government, politics, open topic one. We'll have one, number two, down the road at some point. Hey, Ron, thank you for letting me join. Hey, Alex, you're welcome. Anytime, anytime. So you got my Gmail, so you can, you can when, you, when you do another one, I can join you or whatever, so if you want me to. Yeah, not to mention that I've got you linked in on the craft beer review of uh, the uh, beer review international beer review guild what do you so mean you're, what do you mean i'm linked under under craft beer I add, yeah but i added you to the international craft international beer review guild uh chat group oh so you can get a hold of me anytime you want then okay you're part of that chat group and so if i i'm gonna always post a link there most of those guys are not interested in talking about history government and politics i understand that no. But if you see the link pop up, no, join it in. Join in, and if the topic doesn't interest you, drop off. You know, no big deal. Hey, so, hey, uh, hey, hey, Ron, if I ever call you on Google Hangouts, which I did because obviously I was going noise at you. I didn't mean to do that. But can I call you any time, just long time for you or anything? You can call. I may not answer. I was out walking. Uh, I mean, you know. You got your thing going on. I got my thing going on. If you call and I have free time, we'll do a hangout. If not, we'll just have to save it for another time, you know? I mean, I tell people. Hi, man. Huh? All right, my man. I appreciate that. I really do. I all right, you're just welcome. wanted to know. That's all. And like uh, another, another area where you can interact with us, we're always talking on alcohol eggs on Facebook. That's a group on Facebook, alcohol eggs. So people, well, I mean, of course, they mostly talk about alcohol beer, wine, and liquor. So they'll say, I tried this drink, I tried that drink. Well, but that's how you can see who's there talking and you can you can interface with them. You can link up with them and talk to them. I don't uh, have Facebook actually, Ron. You I don't, don't have Facebook? No. <laughs> yeah, well, that might be a good thing actually, but um, <laughs> but it's fun, you know, it's a group. And then we have rock and roll clubs. So, you know, uh, we talk about rock music, you know, and that's pretty laid back too. So uh, that's a good way to interact. Now, as far as all this like personal chatting, people will try to make friends with me on Facebook and then they want to do all this chit chat all day. I'm like, nah, I'm not really into that. I tell them that. I just. Yeah, I know. I you, you said to me a little while back on your uh, Facebook page, it does. It says you don't chat a lot. You mean you're not a chatty person or something. That's what you said, right? Yeah, I'm, I had to put that in there. I'm not chatty. I mean, I'm not saying that. If somebody contacts me and says, oh, look, uh, we, we, we were looking to do this hangout next Friday at six. You think you could join? I'll tell them, oh, no, I have to go to a baseball game, whatever. Fine. But I'm talking about these people that want to do open-ended chat. They must not have much to do all day. So they, they'll they say, hey, dude, sup? All right, Ron, so, I'm going to let you go. I don't want to keep you on too long. I okay. All right. I'm just – yeah, you can drop off if you but, want. 
feel free, you know, take care. Oh, listen, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I thought you were leaving. That's why I was saying. No, about, uh, no I'm about to shut off. I'm just saying. So then you get these kind of peculiar types and they'll say, uh, and I, I don't know these people. I mean, I talk to my family and friends who I know, you know, like I know them. So, uh, but they'll say, uh, oh, hey, what's up? And I'm like, oh, I'm fine, you know. Oh, and they want to do what I call, I call it open-ended chat. Like there's no particular reason to be talking. They just want to talk. Oh, how about this? How about that? Yeah, I'll talk about this. I knew this guy. What do you think about that? It's like commiserating like this open -ended. And I'm like, well, I'm... And I'll tell them sometimes, they're like, what's up? And I'll say, I'm getting ready to go to work. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, if you could drink a beer, and I'm like, whoa, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't understand the part about I'm getting ready to go to work? Yeah, you can't drink a beer before you go to work. You get in trouble. <laughs> well, it's not even that. It's like, I, I'm not going to do an open-ended chat. I'm getting ready to go to work. I'm trying to do things. You know, I'm, I get on Facebook. I want to check people's posts like, oh, yeah, it was a nice birthday party they had with their kids. You know, that's kind of nice. Uh, oh, this political thing. I might make a comment like, yeah, right. I read about that. But this open-ended chat with people I don't know, I'm really not going to do that. Okay. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, last comments. Let's see. Uh, hey, Ronnie, what are you having for dinner, though? <laughs> this is a perfect example. All right. Uh, nothing. All right. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not being flipped. That's actually the truth. Okay. Uh, uh, Steve says, Bon ton roule. And Ari LaFleur says, thank you, Ron. And then John Martin says, thanks. It's an Iron City day for me, says Hail Brack. Yes, I've tried that beer. Not the light. And then Steve from Philly says, laugh out loud. Who's this guy? Guy? You mean a lot of guys. There's a whole group of them. And, um, I don't know what these people do all day long, but it must not be much. And um, I just cannot get into, involved in this open-ended conversation with people I don't know about every insignificant topic. Oh, you mean on the Hangout? Oh, Alex. That's Alex. Your friend. I don't know Alex. Alex is a viewer. He's very pleasant. He's commented off and on for years. So he wanted to know, could he join? I said, yes. See, it's very easy. No, you well, know in person. You know me through comments and stuff like that, Ron. No. Right, right, right. Not in a person at a personal level. Okay. Well, folks, uh, well, one day down the road, we'll do another open-ended topic. And if people are interested, if not, well, we don't have to do it. It's not uh, crucial anyway. Thanks for watching. And uh, everybody take care and have a great week.